Good morning, everyone. My name is Miriam Aylward, and I am the executive director of NESI. We are the organization that is hosting today's event. I'm broadcasting to you from my home office in Western Massachusetts. Just a quick note, if you haven't already filled it out, you'll see a poll up on your screen. Completing it will help the presenters tailor their talk to your background and interests. So please take a minute to go ahead and do so. It's been so exciting to see people registering from, for this event from all over North America. Uh, some of you I know, some of you are new to Nessie. To all of you, welcome. We're, we're so glad you could join us. Uh, Nessie's mission is to advance the adoption of sustainable energy practices in the built environment by cultivating a community of practitioners who share, collaborate, and learn. Over the last few months, we've been busy finding ways to continue to connect our community remotely. I encourage you to check out nessie.org to learn more about what we're up to. The presentation you're about to hear is entitled ASHPs and VRF, how about these HFC refrigerants? Uh, the event is generously sponsored by a Nessie member, Daikin. We've had a record number of registrants uh, for this webinar. If you're here and listening, I'm sure you know how important this topic is. Daikin has been a wonderful partner to Nessie as an industry leader member, uh, volunteering on our content committees, and most recently by becoming a sponsor of our annual conference, Building Energy Boston. In just a moment, you'll hear from J.S. Rancourt of DXS New England and Dan Smith from Daikin, and they'll introduce themselves. Um, J.S., Dan, John, and everyone at the Daikin team, uh, thank you so much for all your support. Before I turn it over to them, I wanna run through a couple of quick uh, tech tips. Uh, first, although you don't have the power to speak in this webinar, we do want to hear from you, specifically your questions. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. We'll be keeping an eye on them throughout the presentation and also setting aside time at the end to discuss. Second tip, we recommend that you select fit to window and side by side under the view options at the top of your screen for the best viewing experience. You can also uh, move the slider in the center of your screen to change the size of the speaker and presentation views. So thanks again for joining us. Ask questions, tell us what you think, and enjoy the webinar. With that, I'll turn it over to Dan and JS. Good morning, everyone. Miriam, thank you very much. Thank you, Nesty, for this opportunity. Um, I want to encourage everybody again, if you're new to Nesty, to please check out their website uh, at nesty.org. They are a great voice and resource, and it is just great to be aligned with them as we uh, monitor and help this electrification movement along in, in our industry that we're seeing. Um, I am Dan Smith again, and I'm sitting here today in our training office in uh, Woolburn, Massachusetts. This is very exciting as we're um, using technology to be able to still connect. So again, thank you, Miriam, for this opportunity. Um, I would like to introduce JS uh, this morning. JS is our representative uh, for Daikin in the New England area, and he has been in this um, with Daikin and specifically VRV as DXS um, for 12 years since 2012, or I'm sorry, for eight years since 2012. And um, he's been four years in Canada, four years here now in Boston, uh, which Boston is very lucky to have him. And um, so it's very exciting to see what he's going to be speaking about today with refrigerants. I think everybody's going to love his information. Um, I did promise him that I wasn't going to cut any Canadian hockey jokes. So, well, actually, that was kind of a joke. <laughs> Anyways, um, without further ado, I want to give the floor over to JS so we can hear what he's got to say. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everybody. I see over 200 of you right now. I'm sure if you were all sitting in front of me, I'd be a bit more intimidated. However, now I'm just going to assume that you're all laughing at my jokes in the comfort of your own homes. 
So behind me, you see a couple of things. I assure you they are for aesthetic purposes only. There's VRV equipment behind me here. I will not be talking about equipment today. Uh, I also have refrigerant on my left, which we will be talking about, although I will not be conducting any high school chemistry experiment on those today. Without further ado, uh, let's get into uh, the discussion. Uh, refrigerants is, are a very interesting topic, although it is quite complex. Uh, over here, poor little Ricky here, my friend Ricky is a little confused about all the different terms and buzzwords and acronyms that you may have heard around refrigerants, uh, CFC, HCFCs, all around. Now I'm gonna test your knowledge and make sure everyone's awake here with a little poll. There should be a poll that comes up. And the question is, which one of these terms here uh, does not apply to refrigerants? So I'll let this run for a few minutes here. Which of these do not or does not apply to refrigerants? So I'll leave you about four or five more seconds here. Uh, I see a few of you have already caught on, a few not as much, but that's okay. That's why you're here. So a couple more uh, seconds here. Two, one, and let's see. Yes, everybody realize that LOL does indeed stand for laugh out loud, which I'm hoping you're all doing in your own homes right now as we speak. The rest of these terms do apply to refrigerants. If you don't know what they mean, uh, I will uh, hopefully be able to teach that to you today. Now, Ricky's also a little bit confused about what is and what is not a refrigerant. Uh, there's CO2, propane, freon, gluon, puron, genitron, and all these things. So the second and last poll of the day to test your knowledge is which one of these is not a refrigerant? So go ahead and start voting. You can try to determine which of these actually is not a refrigerant. Uh, lots of answers already coming in. This one's a little bit more all over the place. Uh, some of you caught on to some of my tricks here. Uh, so I will leave about 10 more seconds. Again, which of these is not a refrigerant? Uh, some great responses here. I'll leave three more seconds. Uh, two, one, and I will end the polling. Let's see what we've got. Um, so uh, CO2 the, is a refrigerant. Propane can be a refrigerant. R290, although it's quite flammable. Uh, Blue One is, Genetron is, and water actually is a refrigerant, mainly used in absorption chillers these days for cogeneration plants. So the answer is all of these are actually refrigerants. So yes, it can get a little bit confusing. Uh, the refrigerant discussion is also quite political. There are many different angles between economics, environmental, and health and safety issues that pull the topic in different directions. This also generates a lot of media and different uh, platforms around the topic of refrigerants. So I have a few prerequisites for this course today. Uh, one of them is please do not be afraid of doing your own follow-up research. Throughout the presentation, I have a lot of links as to the articles that I use. Uh, please feel free after the fact to follow up on those and make your own educated opinion like one should on any political topic. There's the health and safety side, there's the environmental side and economics, so I urge you uh, to go and do your own research. My goal today is to educate you as much as possible on the topics and then allow you and give you the ability to do your own research. And finally, please don't let a little bit of high school chemistry scare you. If you did not do high school chemistry, don't worry, you'll still pass this course. If chemistry gave you headaches, hopefully it won't today. Without further ado, let's jump into our agenda. So I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about why we care about refrigerants. I'll get into carbon molecules uh, and I'll introduce CFCs, HFCs, and then uh, we'll get into phase downs in the US or the lack thereof. We'll talk about the low GWPA1 challenge and life cycle climate performance of refrigerants, which is a term I'm hoping you all become familiar with today. Uh, I'll, get, I'll talk about A2Ls. If you are familiar with refrigerants, you probably know about the A2L refrigerant classification. We'll talk about that and uh, where it's at in terms of building codes, and we'll finish with R32, our ultimate and future A2L refrigerants. So let's get into it. Let's talk a bit about buildings today and their requirements. All buildings essentially require cooling. We've got to cool the space. We've got to cool the ventilation air, the fresh air from the outside to keep our buildings healthy. 
And the majority, if not all buildings, do this using the refrigeration cycle. On the ventilation side, we may also use some form of energy recovery. I will not explain today what the refrigeration cycle is. A quick Google or YouTube will give you some nice animations on that. The point is, if you're sitting right now in a building, whether it's your house or an office, and the building is air conditioned, there is refrigerant somewhere in or around that building. Whether it's a chiller in the building, a packaged rooftop, or the air conditioner sitting outside your house. On the heating side, buildings today, hopefully yesterday's buildings, we got to heat the space, heat the ventilation air. We tend to combust some sort of fossil fuel, whether it's a boiler or a furnace. And on the hot water side, we also combust some sort of fuel. We'll get back to that in a minute. The point is, why do we, people on this phone call uh, with Nessie, why do we care about refrigerants? Well, we just found out that they're already in all of our buildings and they will continue to be in all of our buildings. So reason number one is refrigerants can have environmental health and safety and economical impacts. Therefore, we care about the rules and regulations and the phase downs of these refrigerants when required. Pretty straightforward. But let's move on and talk about the buildings of tomorrow, especially all of us in this group looking at all electric buildings, net zero buildings, carbon neutral buildings. You're gonna see here every part that used to have a fossil fuel combustion component get converted to some sort of refrigeration cycle or the inverse of our cooling equipment becoming heat pump equipment. Again, I will not explain the refrigerant cycle and how we, re we reverse it into a heat pump. However, these blue sections here is where VRV and air source heat pump are starting to apply. So our second reason uh, and most important reason for us on this phone call as to why we care about refrigerants is the leading technologies today to electrify buildings. It's not the only technologies, but still the leading technologies, air source heat pumps and VRV now introduce refrigerants into the building. Instead of being outside in the air conditioner, on the roof, in a chiller, we're now distributing this through the building to get the heat into the building. Therefore, we care about ensuring that any phase downs leaves sustainable options for refrigerants that can be run through buildings. And that's what we'll go through today. So first, let's talk a little bit about carbon. Everything with uh, uh, greenhouse emissions talks about carbon uh, uh, emissions, carbon reductions, carbon neutral. So let's talk about carbon. Our nice little atomic number six here, our element that has six electrons, two in the first shell, four in the outer shell, it wants eight. Therefore, carbon has four valence electrons. You got a high school headache yet? Whip out those notes if you have them. But what that means is carbon is always looking to make four connections, four bonds. Let's look at CO2. Carbon makes two double bonds with oxygen because oxygen, atomic number eight, has two valence electrons. It's looking for two connections. Therefore, carbon dioxide, which is a refrigerant, R744 is what it's called. It's a very high pressure refrigerant. You have to pressurize it a lot uh, to liquefy it, which is what you need to do in refrigeration systems. Therefore, the equipment gets complicated. Bringing that throughout the building gets complicated, but it is actually a refrigerant. But that's what CO2 looks like. Uh, this is where we introduce our first metric, which is the global warming potential of refrigerants. Essentially, how much energy will the emissions of one ton of a certain gas up in the atmosphere um, absorb over a certain period compared to one ton of CO2? So CO2 is our baseline, it gets a GWP of one. Uh, everything else is compared to, GW, uh, to CO2. GWP is not a measure of how efficient equipment is. It only looks at that uh, molecule. If it gets up in the atmosphere, how much energy will it absorb compared to uh, CO2? Let's continue with other common carbon-based chemicals. This one is called methane. You might be familiar with it. This is what it looks like. Again, four connections, one to each hydrogen atom. This is methane. It's also known as natural gas. Natural gas, as you know of today, uh, is essentially pure methane. It's also known as R50. Methane is a refrigerant or could be. Now, for obvious reason, we don't use it as a refrigerant because it's a fuel. It's highly flammable. Uh, it also doesn't have the thermodynamic properties that we may want. Uh, methane has a GWP of around 28 according to the fifth assessment of the IPCC. 
However, there's estimates of it going up to around 100. So what that means is one pound of methane up in the atmosphere and the stratosphere is the same as, a, as up to 100 pounds of CO2. So we care about that because humans and animals generate methane, but also our natural gas pipelines also leak and generate methane. And obviously, if we do get the gas to our buildings and we burn it and we combust it in a very clean way, but we generate CO2 at around this ratio. So that's methane. It could be a refrigerant, but we don't use it. So let's introduce our first refrigerant here. Uh, this is dichlorofluoromethane, also known as Freon. This is essentially the first refrigerant, first safe refrigerant synthesized back in 1930. This is known as R12. The GWP of R12 is over 10,000. It's extremely high. Now it's important to note that the CFC is now fully phased out, but it was not due to its GWP. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, let's talk about the naming convention. You're, you're gonna hear the word R dash something a lot, R50, R22 beside me, R410A. Uh, so there is some method to the madness. Uh, there's different series from zero to 1000. Uh, the methane series R50 fits in there. There's a propane series. Propane is R290, it fits in there. R410A is a zeotropic mixture. It's a 400 series refrigerant. Water is R718. It gets a number as well. And that's a 700 series. And as a quick trick, I won't go over it. If you're curious, there's a way to figure out how many carbon, hydrogen, and fluorine atoms uh, a refrigerant has by taking its number after R, adding 90, and dividing it up this way. Something you can look at uh, later if you are interested. So let's talk about CFCs. We already talked about R12. R11 was similar, a little bit better on the GWP. Uh, these are hydro, or, or sorry, are chlorofluorocarbons. Sounds like a complicated name. <clears throat> it's usually one word. I just separated it out so we can read it better. Uh, they're called CFCs because they have chlorine, fluorine, and carbon as their components. That's it. Uh, soon after R12 and R11 were invented came the first HCFC known as R22. I have a box sitting right here, 30 pounds of it right beside me. A much better GWP under 2000. This is a hydrochlorofluorocarbon. Why? It has a hydrogen, a chlorine, a fluorine, and a carbon. That's why they're called HCFCs. Now the issue with all of these is that chlorine molecule. These are very stable refrigerants, which means the majority of them make it up to the stratosphere and they can last there for a long time. However, the, the rays from the sun will eventually break that chlorine carbon bond and let the chlorine loose to do whatever it wants up in the stratosphere. And that it does. Uh, a chlorine molecule will attack O3, which is an ozone molecule, and create what's called chlorine monoxide and oxygen. Now, if that's all it did, if one chlorine molecule just broke down one of our beloved O3 molecules up there, uh, we wouldn't have much of an ozone issue. The problem is that chlorine monoxide that it creates is not done. It's going to go find some loose oxygen atom up there, which exists due to the sun rays, and it's going to create chlorine and oxygen. Again, what that means is now we have a loose chlorine molecule <clears throat> that goes back, <clears throat> does the cycle again, and it can do this up to 100,000 times. This is why chlorine is a big problem if it gets up in the stratosphere and it attacks stratospheric ozone. For that reason, we now introduce our second metric called the ozone depletion potential, which is essentially the effectiveness of a refrigerant at removing ozone relative to R11. So in this case, R11 and R12 are the baselines. R22 is actually much better. It's about 1 20th of the ozone depletion of what these original CFCs had, uh, but R22 is still a, a problem. So we enter the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol is to this day, the only fully globally ratified UN, <clears throat> Sorry, a UN environmental agreement uh, around the world. It's also deemed the most successful. So starting back in 85 is when scientists started noticing a depletion of the ozone layer in a hole the size of the United States above Antarctica. By 87, the Montreal Protocol was signed uh, specifically targeting chlorine-based refrigerants, CFCs and HCFCs. At the time, 
the United States had a huge involvement. They were a cornerstone in ensuring that every country in the world was ratifying it under the Reagan administration. By 1996, 100% of CFCs were phased out. Those are the real dangerous ones for the ozone. Uh, so it took only uh, eight years uh, to or so to get those completely out. Uh, by 2010, uh, the limitations on HCFCs meant that manufacturers stopped building equipment using R22, although you could still buy it and make it for old equipment. And by last January was the official end of R22 production or import into the US. So does JS have an illegal black market box beside him? No, I do not. You can still get R22 if you get it from a recycled source, which is what a lot of the R22 uh, currently comes from. Uh, I was just talking to a technician a couple of days ago and he has a box of R22 in his truck. I said, what are you gonna do with that? He's gonna wait till the price of it goes up so you can sell it down the road. So that's happening. But there are some drop-ins available. Uh, you know, we work at a company called Blue On that has R458, which is a non-chlorine based drop-in to your old piece of R22 equipment. Other than that, R22 is gone. Now, people ask, is there an illegal trade and black market for uh, these refrigerants? There sure is. Uh, this is an article, I have the link there, last month, 72 tons of R22 were confiscated. So there's a legal trade going on still of HCFCs. There's CFCs still getting traded, not for HVAC, but for other things. And even HFCs, which I'll talk about in a minute, there's already in Eastern Europe, some illegal trade from Asia coming in because Europe already has face downs on HFCs. So that's already uh, happening. So let's get into uh, a bit of the technical stuff and let's talk about refrigerant classification uh, and let's introduce HFCs. We're gonna talk about ASHRAE quite a bit. They have two different standards. They have ASHRAE 34, which classifies the refrigerants, and it does so in two ways. It classifies it based on toxicity and based on flammability. On toxicity, there's category A and category B, low toxicity, high toxicity. Category B is generally not used. Uh, ammonia is an example of a refrigerant that's a category B toxicity. It's still used in arenas, but there's lots of rules around it. Now the hot topic these days, no pun intended, is flammability. So essentially, one thing to note is even though these refrigerants have a non-flammable logo on them, all refrigerants can essentially be combusted. All refrigerants that we use can essentially be combusted if they're put into a high energy situation. If this building was to uh, uh, get on fire, any refrigerant in here would eventually combust. Uh, however, a class one refrigerant is class one, two, and three. A class one refrigerant means it has no flame propagation when tested at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Class two and three refrigerants do get some amount of flame propagation. And the way to, that, we, that we separate those, there's a lower flammability, class two, and a higher flammability, class three. And what we look at is the lower flammability limit, the LFL of a refrigerant. What that means is how much of that refrigerant, what concentration would I need in this room for the refrigerant to sustain a flame? And if you don't need much, that's a dangerous refrigerant. Therefore, it becomes a class three refrigerant. The heat of combustion is also something we look at. Now, the recent topic, not so recent, but is there's a new subclass for A2L refrigerants that burn very slowly. It is called the A2L or the 2L category. So if a refrigerant is an A2, but the velocity of a sustained flame is less than 10 centimeters per second, that's about 20 feet per minute, if you imagine how fast that is. It is categorized as a 2L refrigerant. Now, later we'll get into it, but the standards already talk about A2L, but the building codes have not yet adopted those standards. That's why in terms of the building codes today in whatever state you're in or in Canada, uh, the 2L category uh, isn't yet fully uh, accepted. The second standard is ASHRAE 15. This is the equipment application standard for health and safety of refrigerants. And ASHRAE 15 does a couple things. The first thing is in all the versions currently in any building codes in US and Canada, there's the famous clause 7.5.2, which basically says if you're gonna put a refrigerant in the building, like a VRV system, a water source seat pump, that refrigerant is cooling or heating air, that coil in there has refrigerant, it's called a high 
probability systems. If you're gonna do that, you can't use an A2, an A3, a B1, a B2, or a B3. Great, what does that mean? What are we left with then for VRV and aerosol seat bumps today in buildings up to today, we're left with needing to use an A1 refrigerant. That is still what we're limited by due to building codes today. The second thing that ASHER 15 does is it looks at the, it introduces a refrigerant concentration limit. And it says, now that we've got refrigerant inside the building, what if it leaks? And what if all of it in one system leaks in one room, in the smallest room? Is there a certain concentration amount that might make that refrigerant dangerous? It looks at, does it become toxic? Does it uh, result in too much oxygen deprivation? Or does it have a flammability issue? And it, the worst case of all three of those determines the refrigerant concentration limit. So let's go pick on R410A over here a little bit. I have not introduced R410A yet. I will in a minute. But in terms of ASHER 15, R410A for all three categories is low toxicity, uh, has no flame propagation at 140 degrees. So the oxygen deprivation determines the RCL. If, and most engineers know this. And there's the famous limit of 26 pounds per thousand cubic feet is what you need to abide with. What that means for reference is if ever a room was at that limit and there was 26 pounds per thousand cubic feet of concentration of R410A in a room, that is the equivalent of OSHA's minimum oxygen amount uh, for a healthy environment. For comparison, in terms of altitude, that's about the same as being at 2,000 feet of altitude. So it's not gonna kill you, although if you start to have twice the limit of refrigerant, you start to be at 5,000 feet, 8,000 feet, you have three times the limit. Now it's getting similar to being at 15,000 feet and up in the big, big mountains. And eventually, if you were to be up there for, a very long, for an extended period of time, you start to have some issues as shown by this OSHA table here. So this is why engineers need to abide by this 26 pound limit or stay close to it to make sure uh, that there's no issues. Now this code does, or this standard assumes that the space is sealed. Obviously by, by code, all of our buildings have certain ventilation, but for safety purposes, it assumes that spaces are sealed and that uh, you are stuck in that space. We'll come back to this uh, later. So let's introduce HFCs. Uh, the most basic, the original HFC is difluoromethane, also known as R32. It is a hydrofluorocarbon. Why? It's got hydrogen, fluorine, and carbon, HFC. It has no chlorine. It has a pretty good global warming potential of 677, and it's got zero ozone depletion. This refrigerant looks great. How come R32 is not the refrigerant used everywhere today? Well, the reason is, as you increase the hydrogen atoms, look how closely that molecule looks to natural gas, right? As you get closer and increase the number of hydrogens, it becomes more flammable. What that means is that R32 is not an A1 refrigerant. It's an A2 refrigerant, or with our new subclass, it's an A2L refrigerant. So what that means is that since the early 90s, we've been taking this beloved high-efficiency R32, and we've been mixing it with a fire suppressant, specifically R125. And that's how we made R410A. So R410A, this tank right here, has 50% R32 and 50% R125. It's a 400 series <clears throat> zeotropic mixture. Uh, it has no chlorine, so that's great. But that fire suppressant is a, has a very high global warming potential, over 3,000. You mix those two together, the GWP of R410A is almost 2,000. So what happened is we solved our ozone problems with uh, HFCs like R410A, but we created another problem with the global warming, warming potential due to the fire suppressants we gotta keep adding to R32. All right, let's take a breather. A bit of an overview of what we've seen so far. CFCs, HCFCs, those are out. HFCs solved our ozone is issue. Uh, the Montreal Protocol, the follow-ups is our ozone is already rebuilding at a faster pace than expected. And by the end of the century, we should be fully repaired. Uh, however, HFCs tend to be flammable and they need to be mixed with some sort of flame retardant to remain an A1 refrigerant, i.e. R410A. This results in higher global warming potential refrigerants 
And the issue is our current building codes only allow A1s in the building, which air source heat pumps and DRVs do. Okay, next step here. Uh, global and federal and state level HFC phase downs. The Kigali Amendment is an amendment to the Montreal Protocol to, re to start phasing down HFC refrigerants. Uh, it was signed back in 2016 and it was supposed to start in 2019 with phase downs for developed countries, including the US, by 15%. Its goal is to reduce HFCs by up to 85%. And by 2036, the US was supposed to have hit the bottom by 2047 for developed countries. Here's an image of, of what those phase down looks like, depending on what country you're in. Um, now, the K K Kigali Amendment is not just or refrigerants that apply to HVAC. Refrigerants are used in other industries like solvents and foams and commercial industrial refrigeration is a big part. Uh, mobile AC is cars, air conditioner in cars. Stationary AC is what we look at in the HVAC side of things. Uh, the Kigali Amendment alone, its goal was to be responsible for preventing a half a degree Celsius or one Fahrenheit rise in global temperatures. Well, this looks great. How come we might not have heard of that? Where are we with this? How come it's not here? Well, the US has not ratified the Kigali Agreement, unlike the Montreal Protocol, where the US was at the forefront of it, the US has not ratified Kigali yet. Uh, in May, there was 32 HVAC companies in North America that sent a letter to President Trump to ratify it. In June of 2018, it was actually a similar letter from 13 Republican senators urging President Trump to ratify it. And a lot of it comes on the backs of the economical competitiveness and job creation aspect of the HFC phase down and the fact that so many other countries have already ratified it. So uh, we also need to talk about SNAP, Significant New Alternative Policy by the EPA, the Env Environmental Protection Agency. Under the Clean Air Act, SNAP is there or has been there to identify and evaluate refrigerants uh, that substitute ozone depleting substances. They've been around for a while. They look at everything, ozone depletion, GLP, toxicity, flammability. If you're a manufacturer and you wanna bring a new refrigerant to the market, you gotta go through SNAP. And they could always kick your refrigerant out of the list if ever they find something uh, better. But what happened in 2016 and 2017 is that SNAP put out, they call them rules, rule 20 and rule 21 and SNAP started introducing HFC phase downs. Rule 20 was not HVAC, rule 21 was for HVAC in 2017, and it did include HFC phase downs for chillers only starting in 2024. Um, so SNAP sort of might have gone outside of what they usually do and started addressing HFC phase downs, uh, which is great. However, they got sued for doing that uh, by Mexican and Thor in 2017, and those guys won, didn't even go to Supreme Court. Therefore, in 2018, EPA vacated all of SNAP 20, that, that first rule that, that came out. A lot, of people, a lot of people were upset about that. The New York Attorney General and 11 others filed a suit against the EPA for the method they used to vacate SNAP 20. And actually, if you have been following that lawsuit, it just got ruled on and they won. So we're gonna see how the EPA is gonna to react to that, although they still, have to, they still have to abide by the uh, 2017 ruling. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, that same company did sue the EPA again around SNAP Rule 21, and they won based on the precedence of SNAP 20. All that to say, uh, SNAP was there, it was great, it was gonna reduce HFCs, uh, it got ruled out. Therefore, there are currently no federal policies in the US to phase down HFC refrigerants. Now, there are a couple things. There's a couple bills, one's in the Senate, one's in the House that were introduced uh, in the past year or so. They both introduce HFC phase downs that follow the Kigali Agreement. We're a little behind schedule, but they still follow it. One of them is by uh, Republican uh, Senator John Kennedy, who introduced uh, 2754. And again, it's very much on the backs of the economic competitiveness and job creation aspect of, uh, of, of this agreement or of HFC phase downs or the risk of not being a part of it. If you have been following this, the update is there's not much movement on this. They're stuck in the House and in the Senate. Uh, the opposition, the Republican side is looking for federal preemption language 
Uh, so if you just Google those bill numbers there, you're going to find all sorts of articles. It's an interesting argument on both sides of the aisles as to the people that are for and against this. That's the last of my discussion on federal politics on refrigerants. But what's happening is similar to what happened with the Paris Agreement, uh, which the U.S. did not ratify. The U.S. Climate Alliance states are starting to take the lead on their own. So some states said, OK, ourselves, we're going to start. Uh, implementing HFC phase downs. And what they're doing is they're following those SNAP 20 and SNAP 21 rules uh, because that was already all laid out. Here's a bit of an overview of which states, uh, your usual suspects, obviously. Uh, some states already have timelines for the proposals. Some states have shown, have declared their intention to implement HFC phase downs, but don't have a timeline for proposals yet. Although I think Maryland and Delaware now do. Uh, so that's where we're currently at. Now, all of these phase downs similar to SNAP, only apply to chillers, and they would start in 2024. Now, California, you might have heard of CARB, um, California, which is the California Air Resources Board. California went a step ahead and or beyond, and they're the first ones to ever introduce a GWP limit on refrigerants for air source heat pumps and air conditioners. Uh, this is the first reference to it. Everyone knew that California was going to do this. Everyone's been, everyone's been waiting to see what that number is going to be. I mean, we wanted to make sure R32 would fit under that. But still, we're going to talk in a minute about how is California going to achieve this uh, with A1 refrigerants. So a bit of an overview. No federal plans for HFCs. A couple bills in the House. Nothing's happening yet. The states are taking the lead. Uh, but any of the phase downs apply to chillers only. So moving on to our next topic, the low GWP A1 challenge. Let's talk about that for a second. Back to electrifying buildings with BRV and air source heat pumps. Um, how do we uh, abide by the current building codes, which only allow us to run A1 refrigerants through buildings while lowering GWP? Well, this started the search for low GWP R410A alternatives that are still A1 refrigerants. So everybody's been going through their chemistry labs and they've been mixing things. And it all starts with our beloved high efficiency R32 and they started mixing things in there. Other refrigerants, other chemicals. You're gonna see a funky, some funky letters up there, 1234YF, 1234ZE. Those are hydrofluoroolefins. I won't get into those today. But everybody's mixing some sort of flame retardant, some sort of way to try and get R32 into the A1 category. So what's so difficult? What is the challenge in finding a low GWP A1 refrigerant? Well, go figure, flammability and GWP are essentially inversely proportional. Has to do with that fluorine um, atom found in most of these fire suppressants. Here's a nice little graph showing you GWP of refrigerants based on their refrigerant classification. Right away, you can see that all these A1 refrigerants are in the 2000s for GWP. And if you want to get within that California 750 minimum, you have to go to the A2L category. Uh, oops, sorry. So essentially, long story short, nobody can get there. Nobody's been able to find an A1 refrigerant with low GWP. Now, some people seem like they might have gotten there. I'm going to pick on R466A. This is, again, mainly R32, some R125, some other chemical. Uh, it's got a GWP of 697, and it's an A1 refrigerant. At first glance, somebody solved the mystery. This looks great. However, there's other things you have to look at with refrigerants when it comes to these complex substances. This is where we start looking at the life cycle climate performance of the refrigerant or how it affects the LCCP of a piece of equipment. That is looking at a piece of equipment and saying, what is the total CO2 equivalency from cradle to grave of a piece of equipment, from embodied carbon to its operation, you got to look at how much refrigerant do you need. If you find a refrigerant that's got less uh, global warming potential, but you need twice as much of it because it can't carry as much heat, then you've lost the battle. If you find a refrigerant that's got less GWP, but it's less efficient and the machine's going to consume a bunch more power, and especially right now in the U.S. with the emissions of our grid, depending where you are, then you've also lost the battle. Uh, is the refrigerant stable? Is it corrosive? Does it use readily available chemicals? And is it owned or patented by a single manufacturer? Uh, unlike R32, which is a non-patented substance that anybody can make. Uh, 
So again, I'm going to pick on R66, mainly because I don't think this was ever going to be a viable refrigerant, so I can pick on it. And here's an example of one that seems like it's got it, A1, low WP, but it's, you need a lot more of it. It's less efficient, more emissions, more operational costs. It's got stability issues and it needs additives, but then there's temperature limits and that iodine molecule in there is an issue. It's expensive to make and it's owned by one company under a patent. So that's why you have to be careful. And to date, there's essentially no A1 refrigerant that can beat R410A by a lot in terms of GWP. So this takes us to, we've got to get A2L into the building codes if we're going to get lower GWP refrigerants um, into our buildings. So first, we have to understand flammability and the A2L. Here's an interesting quote from an AHRI article. I, there's a link at the bottom there. I strongly recommend you read that article there because it gives you all sorts of good guidance. Um, the shift uh, to shift the balance towards becoming more environmentally friendly, we must accept some degree of flammability. And to some, that might seem a little scary, rightfully so. Let's understand, first of all, that R410A behaves very similarly to R32, an A2L refrigerant, uh, when exposed to higher temperatures in a fire. An, an A2L refrigerant cannot get ignited from static sparks or toasters or intermittent sparks. Um, the A2L refrigerants cannot sustain a flame with concentrations below the lower flammability limit, which the codes or the standards are addressing. They have similar hot surface ignition temperatures. That acronym is going to start being discussed quite a bit. But one of the questions, one of the thoughts is, hey, isn't the issue the byproducts? If there is a fire in the building, yeah, okay, R410A burns, but what if R32 burns? How about the byproducts? Well, both R410A and R32 generate hydrofluoric uh, acid. They do not generate hydrochloric acid, which this R22 used to in a fire, and that's the big issue. So the byproducts of R32 are similar. It makes sense because R410A is made of half R32. Again, the discussion around flammability, around the 2L category is where a lot of arguments are happening. This is where I urge you to do your own research Look at some of the discussions out there between the fire marshals that are for and against it and uh, some of the testing that's been done out there. Uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, the, uh, the, bottom, the bottom link here is a research from the University of Maryland, the second link there, uh, where they look at the hot surface ignition temperatures of R32 versus other refrigerants. Let's get into codes and standards. So ASHRAE uh, 15, which we talked about, is now uh, on the 2019 edition and they have now created a brand new 7.6 section specific to A2L refrigerants. So ASHRAE 19, sorry, ASHRAE 15, 2019, starts to introduce things like adding warning labels. But the big one is the introduction of refrigerant detection for to allow A2L refrigerants in buildings with automatic shutdown of equipment, except for fans, if ever they see a certain amount of refrigerant concentration. It also limits ignition sources in the ductwork or in the spaces. ASHRAE 34 also, as I shown earlier, now has the A2L classification in there, which R32 falls under. How about equipment standards? Right now, all of our equipment is tested under UL 1995, and that is going to be uh, valid until 2024. Although what's currently in the pipeline is UL 60335-2-40. Don't ask me why it's named that way, but this is the new standard for VRV and air source heat pump becoming effective in 2024. It's a binational code. US and Canada will follow the same code. It's based on the international code, uh, which is currently being used in Europe, which is why Europe can use A2Ls in buildings, which is why Europe already has phased down the F gas regulations. It's called, they already have phased downs on HFCs. Uh, the, the UL version in the US is a lot more conservative. So. Uh, we're being, a, we're a lot more conservative in the U.S. on flammability and safety, which is a good thing. Uh, so that's UL 60335. Uh, it's already available for manufacturers to start doing R&D on their equipment on this. But the big thing that this UL standard now does is it introduces factory installed refrigerant leak detection as part of the equipment and as part of the testing. So it seems as though the ASHRAE standards have A2L covered, the equipment standards have A2L covered, so aren't we good to go? 
The answer is no. These are standards, not building codes. Our handcuffs are at the, oops, sorry. Our handcuffs are at the model building code levels, the UMC and the IMC. These model building codes are the first ones to go and then the states and the follow the model national codes. Uh, so far, the 2021 round of uh, the, these model code updates, they have rejected the A2Ls. The next round is 2024. The work on that starts in 2021. Uh, so that's the next chance to get A2L and the new ASHRAE and the new UL into the model uh, codes, UMC and IMC, at which point the different states are going to have to update their codes based on the model codes. And that can take anywhere from one to eight years, depending on their cycles. So we're a long ways away from getting the new ASHRAE or the new UL into our building codes. For that reason, some states, California and Washington, are considering no longer using these model codes in order to incorporate A2Ls into the building in order to phase down HFCs. Here's an article from last year uh, from uh, Washington saying they have voted to fully adopt 90.1 at 15-2019 and the new UL code. They'll be the first state to bypass the model code to directly adopt ASHRAE and UL standards to allow the use of A2L refrigerants. It'll be very interesting to see. I'm not sure how they're doing that. I was reading their building council meeting minutes and I didn't see where they did it. I'm not sure if they're fully bypassing the model code. So we'll see what happens. They've been delayed this year for obvious reasons in doing that. We'll see what California does or any other states, but there's some precedents there. Uh, one quick uh, side note, AHRI has a safe refrigerant transition task force who are highly involved in trying to safely get these refrigerants, these low GWP refrigerants into the different codes. There's a link here. They update you on where they're at. Uh, it's a great link to look at. Our final topic is, uh, A2L, as we all impatiently wait for A2L to be allowed in buildings, manufacturers got to start picking their A2L horse, we call it, and start designing equipment with it so that we're ready for whenever uh, they come out. Now, let's go back to that chemistry lab where we're mixing R32 with other things. Let's try to try and make the best A2L refrigerant. What's happening is every time you mix something with our beloved R32, you're doing something bad to it. You're making it less efficient, you're making it conduct less heat, needing more of it, you're, you're raising the GWP. So essentially what's happened globally, and it's almost fully agreed upon that you just gotta stop mixing things with it. And R32 is essentially becoming the go-to A2L refrigerant of the future. If, you look, if we look into more detail, R32 is more efficient than R410A, about the 10%. Uh, it's got a higher capacity, so you need less of it. Uh, its GWP is 677, but if you look at the fact that you need less of it, it's revised, its theoretic, theoretical modified GWP is 472, even lower. It's readily available because it's already being used everywhere. Every pound of R410A has half a pound of R32 already in it. And there's actually over 100 million air conditioning units around the world with R32. You go to Japan, you want to buy an air conditioner for your house, you pick one of the 50 brands over there, almost all of them are using R32. It's also a simple, pure refrigerant. It is not a mixture. There's a link here. This one is on the Daikin website that talks a lot about R32. Now, one thing I want to mention, some of you might know that Daikin is highly involved in R32. Daikin released all sorts of patents uh, about 10 years ago. They launched the first R32 machine. Now they've fully released their patents globally. They're also a manufacturer of it. The reason I'm bringing this up is that Daikin, this is not a Daikin, ish, a, a Daikin only product. And here's some snapshots of all sorts of other manufacturers, either chiller manufacturers and or VRF manufacturers that have released that they're using R32 in their machines and they're already developing that because they're being used overseas where, where A2Ls are allowed or they're being used in North America because chillers being outside the building don't, don't need to follow all those ASHRAE rules of refrigerants inside the building. There's some limitations, but you're going to start seeing R32 chillers in the U.S. as well. Uh, Daikin is also developing those. Next question for us is, how about VRV? Yes, there is R32 VRV around the world. Uh, VRV5, if, if you know me and you've talked to me, you've heard me talk about VRV4. 
VRVX, VRV Aurora, VRV5, you have not heard of. It's in Europe. It's R32. It's not coming yet for all the reasons we talked about. We're not the only ones. Other manufacturers like Mitsubishi have launched R32. So other Japanese manufacturers have launched some R32 VRF. Even the non-Japanese manufacturers are starting to come on with some R32, such as LG and others. So one last comment here. I am running, uh, I'll finish in one minute and open up the Q&A. If you remember our ASHRAE 15 limit on RCL, I'm gonna raise a little warning here on R32. Remember, RCL looks at the worst of toxicity, oxygen deprivation, and flammability. And now that we have R32, oxygen deprivation is no longer the limiting factor, but it is the flammability concentration limit. So one of the rules with the new ASHRAE uh, 15 2019 is, if it is an A2L refrigerant, we're gonna take the lower flammability limit, which is the minimum concentration you need for a flame to sustain. We're gonna divide it by four, the safety factor of four, and that becomes our maximum refrigerant concentration limit. So that means that R32's RCL, that 26 pounds for R410A is now 4.8 pounds. So ASHRAE 15, says, all right, to put A2L in the building, you need refrigerant detection. If you're over four pounds, all these systems will be. But there's no warding yet on the RCL. So if I've got refrigerant detection, does that mean that I don't need to meet the 4.8 pounds? Because if I do, that becomes very challenging. So that's still left to be done. There's an ASH rate committee out there called Technical Committee 8.7. Um, that's uh, one of our fellow DXS team members sits on this that works with ASHRAE 15 to try and incorporate that. So there's still things to be done around the RCL. Uh, quick conclusion here to try and cover everything I talked about in one slide. So you're not as, so you're not as confused as Ricky at the bottom, at the beginning of my presentation here. CFCs and HCFCs are out. HFCs have high WP due to the flame or retardant additives that we put in it. Uh, building codes don't allow anything but A1s inside the building and we're still years away there's no federal phase down HFCs, but some stuff's in the works. The Climate Alliance states are starting to implement SNAP-like phase downs. Is SNAP-like a word? I don't know, I made it up. It means it refers to SNAP. Uh, it applies to chillers only. VRV and SRO heat pumps cannot transition to lower WP until A2L is allowed in buildings. Uh, and R32 is the go-to refrigerant with the lowest life cycle climate performance impact on the equipment. Uh, with that, 11.52, uh, Dan, I'm going to ask you to come back on. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen, and then you and I can start fielding some questions. That sounds good, JS. I, I got uh, tongue twisted just listening to you and present all this information. Uh, great job. Um, we do have a, a number of uh, questions, and... Um, just, just to remind everybody, we will be staying on past noontime um, just to continue to answer questions. We've, JS and I have made ourselves available to continue fielding any questions you might have. Um, so a question that I am seeing um, consistently asked is um, if you could explain the possibility of using CO2 as a refrigerant. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because CO2 is the, one of the lowest GWP we could have. There are CO2, HVAC, and refrigeration machines out there. The issue with CO2 is its pressure. Uh, refrigerant system, the refrigerant cycle, you have to constantly evaporate and, con and condense refrigerant. And to condense CO2, you need a lot of pressure, which means all the equipment, the compressors, but mainly in our world, all the piping that comes through the building becomes a challenge. It needs to be rated to higher pressure the copper, the welding, the fittings, and all of that. I think that's one of the limitations uh, for it. And usually CO2 is used in low temp refrigeration uh, applications as well. So the pressure is the big limitation on CO2. Okay. Um, did SNAP 20 and 21 cover heat pumps? No. So SNAP 21 only covered uh, chillers, and that's because of the whole issue with um, only A1s being allowed in the building. So SNAP21 said, all right, we'll start phasing down things and chillers that are outside in the building. Because even though the building codes uh, don't recognize A2L, these refrigerants are A2s, it's okay to have an A2 outside the building. 
Now, some of the states said some things like, all right, if it's an A2 chiller, you got to keep it 20 feet away from the building, or you can't have more than 1,000 or 1,200 pounds of it. There's some rules around it, but because you can put an R32 chiller on the roof and not have to follow the, some of the rules of refrigerants inside the building, SNAP21 said, all right, let's start attacking those low-hanging fruit and phasing those down. All right. Um, can you address R744? Uh, it was not seen on the flammability chart. Uh, so that's CO2. So okay. Okay, that, yeah, yeah, so I believe that's yes. CO2. So that's the same yeah, discussion correct. about that. Right. CO2 would, would look great on the flammability front. Bear with me here. I'm going through some of the questions now. No problem. You're picking the easy ones for me there, Dan? <laughs> yeah, I'm you told me to set you up, so I'm trying to make it good and easy for you. Um, let's see here. Somebody said, if, you, if I recall properly, DuPont came up with the R numbering system. That is correct. Uh, um, also... If yeah, I, I don't know when uh, Miriam uh, wanted to come back in, uh, I'm seeing some uh, Nessie related questions too, as we kind of filter through some of these questions. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about CO2. One's about ammonia. Ammonia is a class B refrigerant in the, in the higher toxicity side. It's still used. Uh, in uh, in arena systems here and there. Uh, wh uh, what's the, why all the stress on VRB rather than ground source heat pumps with water? There's a question about that. Ground source heat pumps are so a great way for buildings to go all electric. Uh, VRV can even be tied to ground source heat pumps. Uh, ground source heat pumps still have refrigerant, and they still use an A1 refrigerant because that heat pump has refrigerant. Uh, but also there's a, there's, a, there's a capital cost where um, uh, for a typical building, your VRF system will be a lower first cost than ground source heat pumps. But ground source heat pumps are, are definitely still a fantastic method, and a lot of them in New England are using that uh, for going all electric. Is there more than one manufacturer producing R32? Yes, there are. There are many people that produce R32. The reason is every R410A canister needs R32, so there's lots of people making it. If you find one, Dan, too, feel free to, I'm just scanning through them as well. Feel free to send them my way. Here's a question, JS. Um, actually, I, some are coming in. I just lost it. It's a question about if a new multifamily building is being built now with a VRV system with an A1 refrigerant and an A2L becomes available in a few years, would the entire system need to be replaced? We don't know yet. Uh, the compressor, definitely. The condensing unit, definitely, will need to be replaced because R32 just runs at a different ratio and a different volume of R410A. Uh, but similar to how... Now, this is more me being familiar with Daikin, but in Europe, when R22 was replaced with R410A VRV, they were able to reuse fan coils and reuse piping. You just have to re-rate them. So I'm hoping, we're hoping that in 10 years when an R32 VRF becomes viable in the US, that we'll be able to go back and if somebody's ready to replace a condensing unit, we may be able to reuse that piping, maybe even some fan coils if we re-rate them a little bit with that new refrigerant, if anything, their capacities will go up because R32 has more capacity, but we don't know that yet. There's still a lot of R&D going on. Perfect. Find anything else? There's a lot of questions. Uh, you hit the last one that I had. Uh, is USGBC lead giving credits for the A2L R32? I don't think so. 
although in chillers, I'm not sure if they've addressed that yet. Um, what percentage of refrigerant is typically, is typically lost to the atmosphere in an HVAC system? That's a great point. We haven't talked about, if that refrigerant stays in that canister or stays in that VRV system, it's got zero impacts on global warming because it's not going up in the atmosphere. But refrigerant systems can leak, and that's when you lose it. Or the end of life management is the big issue. That's a whole other topic in trying to manage people, not dem dem demolishing buildings or ripping out units and just letting that refrigerant leak, leak out uh, and recovering that refrigerant. Uh, so that's a big part to address. We, they estimate that over 80% of refrigerants made end up in the atmosphere between leaks and end of life. That's a big part to address. Um, so that's why we're so concerned about their GWP. Hi, Jess and Dan. I, I just want to jump in for a minute because um, we're right at noon. Um, as Dan mentioned before, um, they, uh, Jess and Dan are willing to stay on and answer more questions if people would like. So please feel free to stay on. But we are at the end of the official presentation. So I just wanted to make sure before we continue to say uh, thanks again to all of you for joining us and um, especially thanks to Dan, JS, Dykin. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email. There were a number of questions about making the slides available and recordings available, and they will be. So we will email those as well. Um, please also give us your feedback and ideas for how we can continue to be a resource for you remotely. We really want to hear what you think. Um, so be well, everyone, and keep an eye out for more opportunities to uh, connect and learn from each other uh, with Nessie in the near future. Um, and I will turn it back to Dan and JS to continue answering some of these questions. We still have about uh, just under 200 people logged in. And so it sounds like people are still interested in, in getting some questions yeah, answered and asking some. So thanks everybody. I'll keep going. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you to Nessie for hosting this. Dan, I'll, I'll keep rolling through some of these if, if that's okay. Absolutely. So somebody asked, didn't you say HFCs are being phased out? Isn't R32 an HFC? Uh, that's correct. So when we talk about HFC phase downs, it doesn't mean all of them. It just means that in the world of HFCs, people are starting to pick the high GWP HFCs and phasing those down. So it doesn't mean all of them. Uh, SNAP 21 talks about specific refrigerants. The Kigali Agreement uh, Amendment talks about specific refrigerants. Uh, so it's not HFCs, all of them in general. Uh, what else we got? Uh, why buy a system now if the refrigerant will soon be obsolete? So essentially in BRV systems, there's no seat pumps with R410A. Like I said, there's no phase down plan. So th this refrigerant won't be obsolete. Again, the R22 phase down took 20 odd years uh, more. And even then, if you have an R22 system now, you can still run it. Uh, and all that. You just can't buy a new one. You can't buy a refrigerant for it unless you buy a recycled one. But that's for 20 years past the, the, the start of the phase down or so. So if we don't predict that there'll be any R410A phase downs in air source heat pump and BRV until there's a viable alter alternative, which is allowing A2Ls into buildings. When that starts, then there'll be quite a few years before uh, that becomes an issue. So you're, you're, you're going to go well beyond the life uh, of the equipment there. Uh, where did the R32 weight per feet cube calculation come from on a flammability standpoint? Um, depends which ones you mean. In the ASHRAE 15, 2019, um, there's a couple of calculations. Uh, one of them is minimum refrigerant quantity of an A2L that requires you to have refrigerant detection. That's 0.212 times the um, lower flammability limit. limit. And then the other one was that refrigerant concentration limit, that 25% of the LFL. That's all in ASHRAE 20, uh, 15, 2019. So I can elaborate on that more uh, in person. Do the California regulations cover VRF or just chillers? So California, anybody doing just the SNAP 21 stuff is chillers only. California is the only one that said, hey, ACs and air source heat pumps, which BRF would fall under, have that 750 GWP. So, but again, there's a big question marks about how they're going to achieve that starting in 2023, because there is no refrigerant that is below 750. That's an A1 that we can put through a building right now. 
And even once that, and we don't think it's going to get discovered. If it does, an equipment has to get built for it. So that's a, that's a question mark. Are the limits and leak detection requirements similar, whether it is a commercial building versus a residential building? So in the ASHRAE 15 2019, which is where they discuss this, again, the codes haven't adopted it yet, but um, in those, yes, there are the minimum requirement of refrigerant charge that, that forces you to have refrigerant detection is different for commercial and residential. But for a typical VRV system, you're gonna need it for both. If you're doing a one-to-one -one air source heat pump, chances are uh, that in, uh, in commercial, in residential applications that you would not need it. Um, again, this is all fresh off the press a little bit and, uh, you know, and it's not being applied yet uh, because the codes don't have it. So there's a lot more to learn there. What about policy development in Canada and the EU? I did not get into that much today. The province of Quebec has uh, uh, intent on phase down plans uh, that are similar to SNAP 20 and SNAP 21. Uh, Europe is the farthest ahead. Europe was the first with their F gas regulation. If you type in Europe, F gas or HFC phase down, uh, and they've got quotas assigned to different companies in terms of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and there's all sorts of, of things put in place, uh, but they're already on that 60335 uh, international code. So they, they're starting to be able to put refrigerant through buildings, but there's limitations there as well. So it's pretty new, but they have phase downs already. Um, I, I didn't get into that much today. Uh, what is the reduction? What is the estimated reduction in pounds per ton when R32 is compared to R410A? Ooh, I had it on that slide. I think it's 28% less refrigerant on a ton per ton basis, R32 versus R410A. I do have it on that slide. How much do refrigerants really leak in equipment? That is the million dollar question. It often gets asked and we, we try to get feedback from contractors on, hey, how many times are you, are you going out to our air source heat pump or our VRV projects and, and, and finding leaks or fixing leaks and and when you do, is it empty or did you lose just 20% of it? And you get a lot of different uh, answers. Some contractors will say, I go back to one in every 20 projects, you know, uh, I've ever seen a leak. And, and usually if a project has 15 systems, well, maybe there's a leak on one of the systems, right? So they do happen. Um, you know, one canister of this, 25 pounds is the equivalent to uh, 48,000 pounds of CO2. So if you lose an entire VRV system of this in the atmosphere, that's the equivalent of a, a, a few cars for a year. It depends how you do that math. But um, so it's a, it's a million dollar question, refrigerant leaks. This comes into install practice and training and quality checks. And these aren't hydronic systems. They get tested to pressure tested to 550 PSI and they get vacuum tested, uh, but things still happen. So uh, I can't answer that. There's a lot of people in the, in the equipment and safety standards looking at this, uh, leakage rates of VRV systems, um, but there, there's no good study on that yet that I know of. Uh, are there any potential for updating current equipment to work with new refrigerants being introduced or will equipment need to be replaced entirely? Like I said, the compressorized, the condensing unit will, will definitely need to be replaced the piping and the components may not. Uh, that answer. Uh, uh, why is it important to allow A2L refrigerants into buildings? It's because A2L, an A2L refrigerant is the only way that we can make a lower GWP refrigerant. If not, we're stuck with A1s and all the A1s like these are at a couple thousand GWP. Uh, I ask about cost, Dean. I'm not sure if that's about the VRF or the refrigerant. Uh, the cost of R32 is gonna be one of the cheapest refrigerants out there because it's the most globally available because R410 uses it and all sorts of other refrigerants start with R32. 
The R32 is going to be very, uh, it's going to be very cost effective. Uh, R22, that cost is starting to go up because you can only buy recycled refrigerant. And, but it's going to hit a limit because at some point, all the, the drop in the new replacements that are more expensive to make, but eventually those will become cheaper than buying R32. So uh, we don't believe it's going to ever skyrocket that high. Hoping that answers your question. Uh, so this is a good one. In the big picture, is there is it better still to move towards electrification in our heating systems despite the concerns over GWP? There is a research that I will put in the slides before I share around this, which says in the US, if you're looking at the life cycle climate performance of an air source heat pump or VRF, and you're looking at its total CO2 equivalents, about 85% of that comes from its efficiency and how much electricity it pulls from the grid due to the emissions of the grid. And obviously that depends on where you are in the country and within there, what power you're purchasing. So right now, the focus should really be looking at LCCP on the efficiency of the equipment and we're looking at refrigerants, how, how they impact the efficiency of it because that's what creates all the CO2 is pulling that power from the grid. As our grid gets cleaner, so picture 100% renewable grid, now the LCCP of air source heat pumps is going to drop way down. Of what's left at that point, yes, the GWP will be a, a larger percentage. But right now, uh, there's about 85, 80 to 85% of it, again, depends on your power. If you're a standalone building, renewable off of solar, whatever it might be, that's a different story. But if you're pulling off the grid, um, that's, that's the biggest driver is the efficiency. Therefore, the answer is the electrification aspect and air source heat pump should be the primary driver. Meanwhile, we're still trying to get A2L into buildings so we can use lower GWP refrigerants so that down the road, when we have a fully clean grid, that doesn't become our problem. Space pack has an air water heat pump. Can it use an A2L? I do not know. Uh, 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 cost, cost, cost. We can answer that one. Uh, Daikin has a residential heat pump boiler that uses CO2 available only in Japan. Will that make it so over here at some point? Not in the pipeline that I know of, unfortunately. Um, are there any new VRF performance cold? Are there any new developments on VRF and air source heat pump performance in cold climates? Uh, I mean. Most manufacturers have cold plant machines. Ours is the Aurora machines that can heat down to minus 22. Will R32 help this problem? Yes, when, when a refrigerant becomes more efficient, which R32 is about 10% more efficient than R410A, that applies to cooling and heating. So it'll affect, uh, improve the cold plant performance. Did the international community identify the source of the illegal emissions going out of China last year or breaking the Montreal Protocol? I believe so. Those were the CFCs being illegally traded. Um, in the presentation, I talked about the R22 seizure last month, and there's a bunch of other articles there that I think talk about it. Uh, is there an authority or a certification that could help consumers avoid equipment that will perform poorly? Um, that's a good one. Obviously, you have the equipment standards. You have AHRI. Uh, AHRI has their equipment performance standards, COP and EERs, and it's 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 pretty commonly known that uh, in the VRF world, uh, those need to be updated, and they currently are being studied and being updated to more to properly represent the true efficiencies of these systems. So right now, the HRI standards are a bit outdated, and that's not a shot at HRI. They're currently working on it. It takes time. But right now, they're a little bit outdated. Once those come out, I think it'll neutralize the playing field a little bit with better standards. Um, but that's the authority and or certification around the performance of the machines. But that's a perfectly installed machine. So the install part of it is the important part. So who are you purchasing that equipment from is a big deal and what kind of on-site support along the way do they have? And the contractors, of course, there's very experienced contractors, there's less experienced contractors. The installation is your biggest protection against um, ensuring that the equipment performs properly 
and that's your contractor, but also your supplier. Who are you purchasing it from? A big part of the, the operation of this equipment is the programming, uh, all the settings you can choose from it. Whenever I hear somebody saying my VRF is not performing as I thought, first thing we look at before we go look at is, is the refrigerant okay, is the pressure is okay, is the programming and the settings. That's the first thing we look at. Code or cost that maintains the uh, Any estimates on annual leakage rates for BRV? Um, no. Can you use R32 as a drop into any current system? So right now in North America, the only R32 systems are PTACs and some window units and then some chillers are starting. So no, you could not use R32 as a drop-in into anything. There are drop-in refrigerants to replace things like R22, uh, but no, R32 cannot be used as a drop-in for anything else. I understand that they can admit to have air to water heat pumps in Europe, Asia, that's correct. What will be beyond R32? That's a good question. Uh, I don't have a good answer uh, for that yet. Um, how do we get to an even lower GWP um, is it, without falling out of the A2L category into the A2 category? You know, propane is almost is no GWP, right? Uh, but that's an even greater flammability risk. So I don't know the answer to that. Is there going to be a mixture in the chemistry lab that's going to take R32 and and mix it with something that drops even further the GWP while not stepping out of the A2L category, possibly. Uh, again, flammability and GWP are inversely proportional and the flammability is currently the issue. Once refrigerant is emptied from a system to tanks, what happens to it from there? Uh, so, Obviously the goal is to get the refrigerant in liquid form and a pressurized canister from here to that machine when you install it. And then your goal is for it to stay in that machine for the entire life. VRV systems don't have filter dryers. You don't ever get in the refrigerant system. You don't change valves. You don't add oil. You do nothing to it. And then at the end of the life, you recover that refrigerant, bring it back to the manufacturer and it gets recycled. That's the perfect life cycle of a refrigerant that never affects the environment. Uh, what happens if somebody leaks some while installing it or if the system has a leak. So that the refrigerant eventually gets out in the atmosphere and, and climbs up into the stratosphere at the, uh, where, where, the, uh, where it starts to have global warming impacts. So these refrigerants are stable enough, less stable than the old CFCs and HCFCs. That, that carbon hydrogen bond in these HFCs isn't as strong, um, but it still ends up up there for a certain amount of time has some global warming effects, and that's how the GWP is, is calculated. Biggest source of leakage in VRV system, poor installation, damage after occupancy, or refrigerant lines versus ODUs? Fantastic question. Uh, one of the, the ways that the, I'd say the first one would probably be outdoors at the condensing unit, at the condenser coil because of a system not properly elevated, installed, and cleared away from the snow. Um, ice on the coil is not an issue. The system's going to defrost, but if snow accumulates, if you don't elevate those machines, you start to have ice build up from the roof. That can cause coils to leak. Uh, the second one is most likely uh, flare connections at the fan coils inside the buildings. Uh, that's very small copper, half inch, quarter inch, even three eighths when you're down there. And if people are working in the ceiling, tugging on things, not knowing what things are, uh, eventually that flare uh, can possibly get, uh, get loose. Uh, so that probably the second source of it. Um, it's quite rare to just get a leakage in a factory device, like in a evaporator coil or a condenser coil. It can happen, but there's all sorts of very good factory testing that, that happens for, for most, most manufacturers. Uh, it's very rare to see a leak in the piping because that, that braze connection is, uh, is the strongest part of the pipe. Uh, but the, the last thing I'll say is uh, refrigerant expansion is what needs to be considered. Uh, that's what causes some leaks or the lack of consideration for refrigerant expansion uh, because a, a piece of copper could be at Forty degrees Fahrenheit in the summer as a suction line, but then in the winter it's going to be 140 degrees Fahrenheit because it's a heating line. So that change in temperature lets copper uh, expand, and usual install practices should allow for that, and it's it's part of that. But if that's not done properly, 
then sometimes some bends start to get some pressure and you can cause some, uh, some cracks there. Hey, JS, uh, let, me, let me just expand a little further on that. Um, sure. Where I'm sitting as well is our uh, training office in uh, Woolburn, Massachusetts. And, and Dykin needs everybody's help to make standards that we push the installers in through our training so that we can get these guys up to speed with our standards. We have very tight standards at our factory when our equipment's manufactured. It goes through very rigid pressure testing and, and we know that the system, or the equipment rather, that's, that's sent out is tight and in in complete. But as it get, makes its way into the field and we have installers, these installations are a bit more technically involved than your average system. Um, and there has to be some care given to that. So creating awareness that we need to have a heavy emphasis on training and getting people in here so that we can share with them the standards that need to be taken in the field at the installation level. Yeah, great, great point. John asks, what are some alternative drop-ins for R22? Uh, I mentioned one blue on R458A we're using. Uh, we, we have all sorts of that. It's a, it's a mix, a blend of about five refrigerants. So that's the end of those. I'm gonna go back and to the beginning to see if we might've missed some. Will you be discussing GWP 100 versus GWP 20 ratings, especially as it relates to near term GWP reduction strategies and the significantly higher GWP 20 ratings of many refrigerants. Now I did not relate to that. That's a great term. GW, everybody just assumes GW, GWP is one number, except uh, it depends on the period of time you're integrating over. Am I comparing two refrigerants and how much heat they absorb over 20 years or over 100 years? Because a refrigerant in the first 20 years might not be so bad, but if it, if it, if it stays there for the entire period of 100 years, its overall GWP is higher and vice versa. So. That's a very interesting point. No, I didn't. I did not talk about that today. Uh, any of the HFC phase downs by Kigali, by Snap Twenty One, California, all use the fourth assessment by the International Panel for Climate Change. Um, that's those are the values they use, and those are all GWP One Hundred uh, values. But that's a great question. I'd uh, could elaborate on uh, down the road. Uh, Okay, any new questions popping in? If I've missed one, maybe rewrite it, everybody, because uh, we're, we're looking at the latest coming in. If not, uh, that might be all we have there, Dan. Oh, here's a new. Uh, oh, hold on. Did Dan miss something? We've got a few here. Some states are pushing for fossil fuel conversion to electrification with air source heat pumps, VRF, and other technologies. What do you think will be the major challenge pushback for the buildings and the grid other than energy cost? Yeah, you are, you nailed it. Energy cost right now, you know, over in Europe, converting to air source heat pump will save you money. Here, and I'll, I'll pick on my region here in New England, uh, it ain't gonna cost you more, it ain't gonna save you more. It's kind of a wash, there's no payback there on the operational cost. And there's all sorts of different models that show above or lower in terms of operational costs. Uh, the other challenges with going to air source heat pump and VRF, I think most people have wrapped their heads around the fact that these things can heat down to very cold temperatures. That used to be a, uh, uh, a big uh, fear, uh, you know, back up in Canada, even up in, in Toronto, up there, colder temperatures, we do it all the time over there as well. And that's going very well and good examples there. But that's still, we come across that is, how is this gonna heat in the winter? Do I need backup heating and, and all that? So most, I'm picking on New England, this will apply to New York as well, uh, even up in, in parts of Canada, uh, we do all these designs without backup heating. So that challenge is, is uh, sort of behind us. Uh, the big step is getting the capital cost. Uh, you go down to Texas, where we, we operate there as well, and VRV has become the lowest uh, in capital cost denominator for a lot of commercial buildings. Most office buildings in Austin, Texas are getting built with, with uh, VRF systems. 
uh, and all that, it's become the lowest cost system. The, the, the cost of the equipment has gone down drastically over the past decade in North America. It's the cost of the install. That one is more market specific. And uh, we're still on the curve down here in New England. Uh, so it's getting better, but depending on who's pricing it, how you're pricing it, how you're designing it, uh, the, one of the barriers is, is just the capital cost coming out uh, above in some buildings, but in some we come down below. And if you're really looking at a holistic building and trying to meet the new stretch codes in the different states and, and uh, trying to get to net zero, uh, as you really start looking at your envelopes and your heat loads, uh, you start to be able to size the equipment to a point where it becomes very cost competitive. So what I mean by that is if you're not doing a solid envelope and or a solid heat loss calculation, somebody's going to come to us and say, I need 100 tons of cooling and 120 tons of heating. Well, that's not how we build buildings anymore. That's going to force me to upsize the VRV system quite a bit. And it's going to be more expensive than the alternative because upsizing a boiler is not that much of an impact. Whereas if somebody's doing a true heat loss calculation, they're gonna say, well, this building needs this much cooling, this much heating, we can size these things better and they become very cost competitive. So uh, heat loss calculations are, are another barrier for sure. Let me, let me move on to the next question here. Uh, what is the, lo the local code for requirements for costs that maintain this equipment? Oh, I think local, okay, I'm not sure what that question refers to. EU requirements require keeping of F gas lockbooks. In your opinion, should we do that in the US to keep track of leaks and provide a database and understand how to improve equipment and installation? That's a great point. He's, uh, the person's talking about logbooks for, uh, for uh, the F gas regulations in Europe. I'm not fully familiar with it, but uh, addressing leakage should be right at the source, uh, one of the places to look at uh, for the impacts of refrigerant on the environment, for sure. Like I said, the majority of the refrigerant still ends up in the atmosphere. Keep it out of the atmosphere, keep it in circulation from system to recycle back into systems would be the way to go. Um, and I, I, I do think logs would help with that. I think it's a difficult implementation, but I, I do think that would help. It would also, I think, help everyone understand where the leaks come from, how to address them, how to reduce them. If they're logged, you can do uh, data analysis on that. Uh, there's a question from one of my own guys. I'll answer you later. Uh, okay. Dan, did I miss anything here on questions? No, I think we uh, have got it covered. Great job answering questions. Um, you can hang on for a couple more seconds here to see. I'll hang around if there's new ones. They all pop up, they pop up at the bottom, right? Yeah, they do. Um, so I'll hang around. Thank you, everybody. I'm always happy to talk into more detail. I had about twice this number, the number of slides I presented, so there's a lot more information uh, if needed. And uh, I'm sure my contact information will be shared, and I'll be happy to help and answer questions, no matter where you are.